Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, Checks and Balances is building a pro-democracy movement of conservative and center-right attorneys, jurists, and law students from across the country committed to the Constitution and the rule of law. Before we get started on our program today, though, I did want to acknowledge and, and condemn the, the brutal and immoral attacks on the citizens of Israel and express our deep sympathy or my deep sympathy and, and other like-minded um, uh, persons uh, for our ally and hope that the United States and world democracies will stand firm in supporting Israel, just as we've done with Ukraine in opposing barbaric attacks on their nations and, and innocent uh, civilians. Um, so uh, with that uh, with that comment, uh, we'll get to our, our discussion, but one more prefatory uh, note. I did want to mention that we will be hosting Checks and Balances Will, our inaugural Rule of Law Summit on the evening of November 8th in Washington, D.C. The event is free, but space is limited. So uh, I would encourage all of you to, to register today if you can. We're going to share the link in the chat now and again at the end of the uh, program. One other uh, uh, public service announcement is to note that Checks and Balances is actually hiring for a full-time executive director to help expand our organization into the new year. And anyone who's interested in applying or uh, learning the details of that uh, can go to our website, checks-balances-org, and certainly encouraged to apply. So uh, getting uh, into the substance now, our conversation today is focused on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the events leading up to and including January 6, 2021, and whether former President Donald Trump is constitutionally disqualified from holding the office of the president. The language of Section 3 is also going to be dropped into the chat. This argument... Um, was uh, proposed by professors William Broad and Michael Stokes Paulson in a forthcoming article in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review entitled The Sweep and Force of Section 3. To dig into the 14th Amendment legal argument and its practical implications, I welcome Judge Michael Ludig and David French. As all of you know, I'm, I'm certain Judge Ludig served on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and testified before the U.S. House Select Committee on the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. He also serves with me on the Checks and Balances Board of Directors. Judge Ludig co-authored an article with uh, Professor uh, Larry Tribe in The Atlantic entitled, The Constitution Prevents Trump from Ever Being President Again, which discussed the argument that we will explore uh, today. David French is a columnist for the New York Times who published a column on Baud and Paulson's 14th Amendment argument. Before joining the New York Times in January of 2023, he was a senior editor at The Dispatch, which he helped start, and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. He spent most of his career as a practicing lawyer and served in the United States Army Reserve as a judge advocate general. Judge Ludig, David French, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to, uh, to uh, discuss the issues that each of you has written about. And at, uh, as we get close to the end of the session, I'll come back and uh, propound the questions that the attendees and participants will enter into the um, Q&A function, not the chat, the Q&A function. And I'll read off those questions and we'll go from there. So I'll drop out now and turn it over to Judge Ludig, David French, and uh, we'll enjoy the intellectual uh, discussion in front of us. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks so much. I thought I, I would launch the conversation by first asking uh, Judge Ludig a question. But before I, I, I ask a question, let me let me just do something very pedantic, which is read the relevant section of the Constitution. So here's what it says. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, 
shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. Um, so, Judge, let, let me just start by asking you a question, um, because we have both written and have both stated that we believe that this section disqualifies Donald Trump. And we'll get into the reasons why we think this section disqualifies Donald Trump. But I want to start by asking you a question. What's the best argument? Let's let's start by steel manning. What is the best argument that you have heard, Judge, as to why this does not disqualify Donald Trump from the presidency? Um, th thank you, David. And thank you, uh, uh, Checks and Balances, for hosting this conversation. Uh, it's especially gratifying for me to be here today with uh, – the, the great David French, um, as I posted uh, this morning on Twitter, and I, I continue to call it Twitter, uh, <laughs> David had, had written a very important piece uh, in the New York Times uh, uh, in August, I believe, in which he, in my words, uh, set forth the uh, constitutionally, constitutional, um, um, political and moral uh, uh, justifications, if you will, for uh, applying Section 3 to the former president. Uh, I hope everyone will read that. As I said this morning, um, everything that David writes is, or almost everything that David writes <laughs> is, is a must read. Um, so first, in, in response to, to the question, David, I would say this, um, you know, the this is the most pressing constitutional issue of, of our times for, for the obvious reasons. And when uh, uh, speaking only for Professor Tribe and I, when, you know, when we uh, first came to the conclusion that we did, that, that Section 3 does apply to the former president, um, you know, we, uh, we believed that we had uh, entertained and, and rejected all of the arguments uh, that that would be made against application of Section Three, uh, in in the uh, relatively short time that we've uh, that this issue has been before the nation, um, it has been vetted uh, by uh, uh, constitutional scholars uh, and and others, uh, and uh, I and Professor Tribe have studied every single response, uh, particularly those grounded in the Constitution itself, uh, to confirm uh, in our minds or, or uh, not that the uh, that Section 3 does apply. And, and thus far, having heard all of the arguments, constitutional and legal, and also political, political with a capital P, uh, I'm satisfied, as is Pro Professor Tribe still, that uh, that Section 3 do does apply. Uh, so to your specific question as, as to what is the best argument uh, for why it, it, it would not apply, um, I'm a little bit at a loss uh, as <laughs> a suggestion, as I suggested earlier, uh, but I think I would choose the argument that was uh, it, advanced by uh, Judge Mukasey in the Wall Street Journal that uh, that the president, former president, as president uh, was not an officer of the United States. Um, uh, I, I rejected that uh, uh, adequately, I believe, in, in, in an in a extensive tweet, uh, book link, book length tweet, uh, if you will. Uh, and and uh, I don't believe that that is a, um, an argument against application at, at all. Um, then then I think that I would segue uh, to to the argument that was first made uh, by our friend, um, Professor Michael McConnell, former uh, 
circuit court judge for the 10th Circuit and one of the leading constitutional scholars of, of our times. Um, and, uh, you know, and right off the, the bat, uh, as soon as, as uh, Professor Baud and, and, and uh, Paulson uh, indicated that they'd be publishing this article, you know, soon, uh, Judge McConnell um, raised the question of whether applying uh, Section 3 to the former president would, would, be, would not be anti-democratic. Um, uh, I and, and, and hopefully most others, you know, uh, we hang on every word that Professor McConnell uh, speaks. Uh, uh, um, Mike McConnell and I were, have been uh, long and dear friends uh, since the, we were colleagues in the White House together in the Reagan, Reagan White House. Um, but I finally responded to that uh, concern, if you will, uh, in, in a tweet where I said uh, to the, something to the effect that, uh, that applying Section 3 so as to disqualify the former president from the presidency in the future is not anti-democratic. The Constitution itself uh, tells us that. Rather, what the Constitution tells us is anti-democratic is the, the, the conduct that gives rise to disqualification under the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, that's my answer to, to that non-constitutional, but very important political with a capital P concern or question that was first raised by uh, uh, by by uh, Professor uh, McConnell. I I would say I like to, uh, I tend to use the word counter majoritarian versus anti democratic because of course a a constitutional amendment is passed through a democratic process involving the democratically elected uh, members of Congress and representatives at that time. So that whole process of passing an amendment, which then puts into play something that I would say is counter majoritarian in the sense that if a majority of people want an insurrection as president, they can't have it <laughs> under Section 3. If a majority of the American people wanted somebody who was too young or wasn't a natural born, that's essentially, that's counter majoritarian. That's the Constitution blocks that sort of purely majoritarian sentiment. What do you think, Judge? So I, I have heard sort of three strands, and you've you've been through sort of them a bit, but I've heard three strands of counter argument. Counter argument number one. He he just doesn't meet the definition when it comes to the actual conduct. He did not engage in insurrection or rebellion, nor did it give, did he give aid or comfort to the enemies, the enemies thereof, meaning the Constitution of the United States. Um and and it seems to me that to make that argument, what people have to do is take a very narrow, um, very specific January sixth only view that places great premium on the throat the lines that Trump uh, stated or the line that Trump stated about protesting peacefully and patriotically, and that therefore if there is no sort of available conviction for incitement uh, that that attack is not on him. Um, my own view has been that that's completely the wrong way to look about January 6th. January 6th was the intended culmination of a larger insurrectionary campaign that also included the fake elector scheme, et cetera. And just as many, many coups that you will see in other parts of the world have both an a component a legal and a military or uh or or insurrectionary uh component so did this one it had the legal pretext the fraudulent lecture scheme followed by an active use of force the storming of the capitol and you can't separate those out and 
And so therefore, just on the very merits of did he engage in the conduct that this prohibits, it fits squarely within that. Because when you look at the totality of the circumstances, this is classic coup behavior. I mean, just classic. He did everything but put on the gray uniform, <laughs> to go back to a Civil War analogy. What's your response to the statement that, wait, the actual conduct at issue was not and did not meet the definition of insurrection or rebellion. Uh, so, David, if I can, you know, manage to to, to hold my, the thoughts that I have in in response to to that multi part question. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and and return to your your prior observation. Uh, you know, the the counter majority um position that that's that has been advanced. Uh, you know, by some. That is the one argument that we know the framers of, of, of the 14th Amendment in Section 3 rejected, mm -hmm. which is uh, to say in, in another way that uh, we know from the, from the, the history uh, of, of, the, of the ratification uh, of Section 3 in the 14th Amendment, and of course, the context that gave rise to, to, to Section 3, that the Constitution forecloses from, from high office one who is engaged in a, uh, a rebellion uh, or, or in, insurrection or rebellion or provided aid and comfort uh, to such. Okay, That's my uh, observation uh, uh, in, in return for yours uh, of, in the previous question. Now, turning to, 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 to this question that you just asked, um, <clears throat> So this is this is the constitutional point uh, that is near and dear to my heart, um, and that, frankly and understandably, virtually no one else has made that I have seen, including constitutional scholars. Okay. So you you read us the the the, the text of, of of section three quickly, but but the one thing that I want to do between now and when the Supreme Court uh, is uh, uh, decides this this question is make clear to to the American people exactly what disqualifies the former president, and it is not that he engaged in an insurrection or, or rebellion against the authority of the United States. Stop, think about that. What section three disqualifies is engaging in an insurrection or rebellion against the constitution of the United States or providing aid and comfort uh, to, uh, 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 to an enemy of the Constitution of the United States. Now, we, we, we can get into, if you want to, uh, uh, the, the difference, but, um, you know, as, as many of our viewers know, um, I, I was appalled by a recent uh, editorial uh, in the Washington Post uh, that was uh, that that called the uh, American people foolish to rely upon section three to disqualify President Trump. Uh, but uh, and and for many reasons that I, I outlined, uh, um, I thought that was foolish of the Washington Post, our friends at the Washington Post. We all have uh, uh, a bad day you know, now and then. That was a bad day for the Washington Post. But the main point that, 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 that got under my skin was just like every single other person, media organization, and commentator, they too misquoted section three uh, and I took them to task for it and 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 I did 
I did it only because this issue is of surpassing importance to the the resolution of this constitutional question. So, so you read the text, read it over, read it over and over and over from now until when the Supreme Court decides it, uh, and focus on the fact that that it is a an insurrection or a rebellion against not the United States, not the authority of the United States, but rather the Constitution of the United States. So just quickly, I said in, in that response to the Washington Post editorial that there is a world of constitutional difference between the two. Uh, to begin with, when, when we talk about an insurrection or rebellion, we naturally and understandably, therefore, talk about uh, a, 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 a military uh, operation to overturn the government, okay? But even to hear the actual words of the Constitution in Section 3, we know that that's not necessarily, if at all, what Section 3 reaches, because it does say insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States. So it's it's right and good for all of us to, 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 to think long and hard about that dissonant uh, thought, if, if you want to call it that, because we've never before had to think about that. But the history uh, uh, confirms that that's exactly what uh, the framers intended. They did not intend to, to, to disqualify one for uh, uh, a, an insurrection rebellion against the United States or the authority of the United States. Um, and of course, that's those are the plain words of, of, of section three uh, themselves. Um, so, um, that leaves us, in my view, with the, the only question, uh, a question that I've said is for the Supreme Court of the United States to decide, the only question that, in my view, is for the Supreme Court to decide is whether or not uh, the, the former president's conduct in and around January 6th, as you rightly pointed out, not simply on January 6th, uh, constitutes uh, uh, in either an insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States or the aid and provision of aid or comfort uh, uh, to uh, the enemy, an enemy of the Constitution of the United States. Um, within the meaning of the uh, of section three that that section having now been analyzed to a fairly well by professors Bode and and Paulson who have concluded uh, that the framers intended a very broad definition of insurrection or or rebellion uh, so uh, Professor Tribe and I have, have have gone on to conclude that yes, the Constitution, you know, does actually disqualify the former president based upon his um, insurrection or rebellion or aid and comfort to enemies of the Constitution of the United States of America. So we're getting some questions in the Q and A, and please keep the questions coming. But there's one I think that we need to. Uh, deal with that is uh, here is a question isn't the applicability of section three contingent upon a finding of guilt of the former president by a competent tribunal here's another one this purports to be a discussion but no one is advancing the counter argument they believe trump's behavior constituted an insurrection but there's been no adjudication of that trump has not been convicted or even charged with insurrection it is fatal to their argument but these panelists brush it off as unimportant 
Um, the problem with that question is that that's not what the section of the Constitution says. It does not disqualify people who have been convicted of engaging in an insurrection. Um, and there's a reason why that is the case is let's remember the context of when this was enacted. This is an enacted after the Civil War. There was not an independent adjudication of every Confederate officer, for example. Your membership in the Confederate Army was not an, a subject of independent adjudication. Now, um, in, you absolutely could raise as a defense in a legal proceeding surrounding Section 3 that you are not, in fact, guilty of the conduct that is you've been uh, – that, that – uh, that those seeking to disqualify you claim you committed, but there is no necessity of a precondition of a conviction. It's not in the text at all. And so there's no argument that you, there's no real viable constitutional argument that a conviction has to precede application of the statute. Otherwise, it wouldn't have applied to the vast majority of Confederates. Um, people who'd actually worn a, a uniform of the Confederate States of America and, and engaged in open combat against the forces of the United States. Judge, anything else you want to add to that? I, I just add to 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 to, uh, to that answer for for the uh, listener that 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 was one of the the foremost uh, conclusions drawn from this uh, the comprehensive scholarship by uh, professors uh, Bald and, and Paulson. With, namely, that uh, Section 3 is, in, in, in constitutional language, self-executing or self-enforcing, uh, by which it meant that there was no finding either by the Congress of the United States, for instance, or, uh, or let alone by a jury of, of, of peers of, of of the former president or anyone else, uh, uh, you know th that that's required, and and then to that I would just add by way of of hopeful um, persuasive uh, effect to to the listener that if you if you if you step back and think about it, um, the our officials, both state and and federal, every day of the week have to, to draw profound conclusions about the application of not just statutes and rules, but even the Constitution. Uh, and those questions are, are invariably intractable. There's a, it's, they're never clear cut, but that's the way government has to work. And that's the way that, that I contemplate it will work uh, here, which is, that uh, as the as the states have already begun to do, you know, and each state has its different process, but uh, it the president's qualification has already been challenged in multiple states, and it will be challenged in in, in multiple more states. And at that point, the uh, the appropriate official within the respective state will have to decide whether to, to list the former president on the ballot or to disqualify the former president from the ballot by virtue of his uh, conduct in and around January 6th. That's no different than any other uh, day of the week, frankly, in the application of law uh, in the United States of America by our, our elected officials. But just like in those instances, so also here, for those questions uh, for which it's warranted, the final decision is for the Supreme Court of the United States to decide. Um, so I uh, I understand from where that listener's coming from, David. Uh, but as you said, that he or she must, must just understand that that's. It's not a constitutional requirement. And, and for reasons we won't get into here, it would never be a constitutional requirement that, that a person be uh, convicted uh, of this. But by the way, just for information's sake, uh, as you know, David, and, and, and most of our listeners know, 
it's 18 U.S.C. Section 2383 that, that uh, criminalizes insurrection or rebellion. Interestingly, not just against the United States or the authority of the United States, but also, also an insurrection or rebellion against the laws of the United States and provides uh, 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 as penalty for a conviction under that statute, the disqualification from future uh, high office. So um, here's another good question from somebody by the name of anonymous attendee. Um, that was an interesting baby naming exercise. Uh, let's go with anonymous attendee. No. So this is a great question and something that I've harped on in podcasts, et cetera. Isn't the debate over whether Section 3 is self-executing a red herring? No one is claiming that Section 3 jumps off the page and enforces itself. Rather, the pending lawsuits that seek to enforce Section 3 against Trump are brought under state ballot access laws. So I have, I have also been a little frustrated by this self-executing kind of uh, discussion because there will be legal process here. Um, I think what is in, meant by self-executing is more that there isn't a specific enforcement authority named within Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And so what is existing is a free-floating obligation that attaches to federal uh, elections. And so, but then the, but at the same time, even if a secretary of state say, says Donald Trump cannot be on the ballot in Minnesota, Donald Trump is going to have access to the courts to challenge any exclusion of him from the ballot, just as any candidate would have access to the courts. So at some level, I feel like it is a bit of a red herring because it is going to be adjudicated. And we'll get to that adjudication process, but judge him interested in your in your take on this what is the whole debate about quote unquote self executing how meaningful is that you yeah, no no you're exactly right david and 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 also right that that the question is is well taken and 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 and, and very helpful uh as i suggested earlier this the the point of self execution or self enforcement uh is is a constitutional technicality mm -hmm. uh uh, and 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 we all know as as lawyers how what that means and and what the, and what that means is that it will be decided in the courts right. um, uh, uh, eventually, but that it also starts to be decided uh, by its in in enforcement either way uh, to disqualify or, or to qualify the former president by the, the the relevant state or or, or frankly federal officials uh, it, it, it could be so no it's it's a red herring uh as a matter of uh, as a matter of law okay uh and but it's 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 anything but a red herring for uh the american people uh that said the american people should not have any pause over th that question uh, for the reasons that, that you and I have both stated. Um, so thank you for the question. So here's another one. Um, Trevor says, here's the legal problem I have with your theory. Let me quote from the amendment. No person shall be a senator or a representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military under the United States. Your entire legal argument hinges on reading something very significant, the president, into a catch-all term at the end of a list, which flies in the face of how we interpret text. How do you surmount that? I'd yeah. love your thought first, and then I'll, I'll jump on if if there's uh, anything I need to add. Yeah, th th this is uh, Judge Mukasey's point that I, I addressed earlier, that, uh, that, that the former president, when he was president of the United States, when he held the office of president of the United States, was not an officer of the United States. 
and 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 like I say, uh, myself and, and and many others have have uh, have explained in great detail the fallacy of, of that argument, which frankly is is uh, based upon uh, the appointments clause, uh, um, which gives to the president of the United States the the authority and power to appoint officers of the United States. But as I explained in, in my, my uh, tweet, um, uh, that, mere, that, that mere fact doesn't mean, ipso facto, that the president is not an officer of the United States for purposes of the very different provision of the Constitution in section section three. And I went on to point out, and this is a terribly, terribly important and relevant to the listener and to all others, you know, to, to, to remember to remember that uh that section section three was added in, in 1868 by ratification of the 14th Amendment, whereas the appointments clause was in the original constitution in 1787 and 1789. So they were speaking to totally different purposes. Uh, there's no reason in the world to think that the use of this the, of the identical phrase would have the identical meaning in those two very different uh, provisions, especially given the purposes that we know section three was added for. And then kind of a a, a teaser for 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 this listener and others. Uh, when I parsed the, the Appointments Clause provision in, in Section 3, um, I realized that, that the Appointments Clause actually capitalizes officers of the United States, whereas Section 3 does not. Uh, and if we want to give uh, uh, every word and comma of, of the Constitution meaning, as the, as the, the viewers suggest we ought, and he or she's correct uh, that we must, then we should take note of the fact that Section 3 is actually a different uh, framing of the term than exists in uh, the Appointments Clause. I'd also add that, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, well, if, if you want to hear Will Bode be absolutely grilled, on these points, I can recommend a podcast that I did with my advisory opinions uh, podcast co-host, Sarah Isger. And Will came on and said, essentially, ask me all the hyper-technical questions about the definition of officer, et cetera, et cetera. And we did that. We went through all of these hyper-technical issues. I thought his answers were very compelling. But he also said something. He said, look, if you're a textualist, you're often leery of sort of legislative history, but also legislative history can have some real import when it comes to understanding original public meaning. And the scope of Section 3 is applicable to a president actually came up at the time. And was there was assurance that, in fact, the scope of Section 3 encompassed was it was as we uh, as broad as we're we're discussing, Judge. And that's much more fully explained in the podcast. Um, you know, David, let me interject there. That I'm, I'm so glad you made that point. Uh, and uh, the the, um, uh, the I, I will call it the the, the ratification history, and uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it does make that point very clearly. And also, if we just think ourselves about it. Uh, the, the framers would have, you know, written and, and this would have been ratified in order to reach someone like Jefferson Davis. And so the contrary reading of Section 3 would entail a conclusion that they would not have intended to reach, you know, Jefferson Davis, you know, if you will, which uh, it would be passing strange. And 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 would defy belief. But before we 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 cut out, I just want to leave our 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 listeners and viewers with the the latest news uh, on this issue, uh, which is from President Trump's uh, Trump and his attorneys themselves. 
Uh, and if you want to, to hear a, a hyper-technical reading uh, of the Constitution, then you have to read the briefs filed uh, by President Trump, where he argues uh, that uh, the constitutional oath, which is prescribed, does, is different from the oath referenced in Section 3, in that the constitutional oath that the president takes requires the president to, to, to pledge to uh, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, whereas the, the, the oath referenced in Section 3 is only the oath to support the Constitution. So literally, the former president of the United States uh, is arguing that he did not ever take an oath to support the Constitution uh, of the United States. Now, that's just silliness. More importantly, and I would want to leave the, our, our viewers and listeners with this point, if that's the argument that the former president is making for the, uh, the inapplicability of Section 3 to him, um, it's all good. He will be found to be uh, 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 disqualified under Section Three with no no qu no question whatsoever. So when um, when oh I'm sorry go, go ahead. ahead David I was just well, gonna I, I have a I, yeah, I have please, a super fast response uh, to one question that I think is a good question. It seems you're saying no independent adjudication is necessary. Um, there will an adjudication. It's going on right now. For example, the Minnesota Supreme Court is taking a look at it. But it says, so your contention rests on whose decision that Trump has engaged in insurrection. Are you saying that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment supersedes the Fifth Amendment right to due process? There is no necessary precondition of an independent adjudication of insurrection in a separate tribunal, like as a criminal conviction or a civil judgment, separate and apart from the actual proceeding that will result as a, say, a candidate challenges Trump's inclusion. The actual proceeding that will occur as the candidate tr uh, challenges Trump's um, exclusion is the process that will occur and is the process that is sufficient. So it's not that there is no process. Now, of course, if Trump just acquiesced and he said, okay, you're right, I engaged in insurrection, I'm not gonna challenge this, then there would be no process, but there will be a process and that process will be re directly related to the decision to challenge Trump's inclusion. Very important point, David. Thank you both very much. Uh, I, you, uh, David, you um, thank you for uh, reading and, and then you and, and Judge Ludi proceeding to answer and address uh, some of the questions that have been submitted through the, the Q&A. Um, and I think they're still coming in. I'm in a room full of uh, Harvard Law students who undoubtedly will have some questions. I'd like to invite them up to, to the podium in a moment. But first, I'd like to make a comment and then also uh, just uh, indulge uh, in the prerogative of, of standing here to, to ask a question myself. On the, you know, the, the, the officer of the United States and hold office under the United States are both mentioned in Section 3, and I think different tests, and, and I think Judge Mukasey in his Wall Street Journal article that, that you, Judge Ludig, uh, raised distinguished between, uh, and I think as you, as you can see, um, Judge Ludig, that um, th there there is uh, there there is both uh, judicial and and uh, legal opinions of OLC uh, that that define officer of the United States as someone appointed under Article Two and um, by the president, and thus uh, Judge Mukasey talked about the uh, you know the the framers of Section Three and Article Fourteen. Uh, weren't hiding elephants in mouse holes. He used that term in, in his article. I don't know whether that turns this in from a major questions doctrine to a major officer's doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, I did want to address, I think Jefferson Davis would have been disqualified on the theory that he had, he it, the oath of office he took was as an official of the United States, which I believe he was, if, if, if memory serves. I believe he was in the Senate, but it looks like David is uh, in the process of researching me, fact-checking me. But I think he would have taken an oath to support the United States uh, previously. So, um, the, the, and this will be a segue into my own question here. 
if the Supreme Court, let, let's just say this goes up to the Supreme Court, as I, I, I agree with you, the, Judge Ludig's comments that this inevitably uh, will, and the Supreme Court is perhaps not uh, if it were if it were looking to make a decision that were not as perhaps cataclysmic as to deny the ballot to a former president uh, who who still uh, carried uh, considerable support uh, according to polls in the in the in the population might they might they rely on this textual argument and your point that perhaps that the same phrase can in different places for different purposes have different meanings. But might the Supreme Court latch on to that, especially uh, Chief Justice Roberts, who I believe in opinions has suggested that the, the president, in other contexts, to be sure, was not an officer of the United States. And, and would the Supreme Court do that potentially if they concluded uh, sotto voce that this was a bad idea, even if it's a compelling argument that what the former president was engaged in was an insurrection against the constitution, you know, textbook insurrection, let's let's concede that for present purposes, but that nonetheless, the impact could be so divisive as to be, uh, you know, a, a, a good and perhaps compelling legal argument, but not necessarily a good idea for the country. So maybe if I could, if I could turn that question over to you. Uh, yeah, let me, so let me take that first. Uh, uh, with, with the only the greatest respect for the chair, um, but noting that that I did have the, the high privilege of heading the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice after Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia, uh, I, I'm unaware of any interpretation uh, of officer of the United States by anyone, including the Department of Justice, other than in the context of the appointments clause, which for reasons I, I staked out earlier in the conversation is, is singularly uh, an inappropriate uh, analog, constitutional analog for interpretation, okay? So no one, to my knowledge, before Judge Mukasey uh, ever uh, said what he did. Uh, and, and, and like I said, I, I think that it's, it's, it's critically wrong and, and, and mistaken uh, with all respect to, to Judge Mukasey. Now to your larger question, the, uh, Alan, the way I think of that is that, that, that it, it your question comes from a place of cynicism about the Constitution and the Supreme Court, the same kind of place that the Washington Post editorial came from. Uh, and as you know, I, I, at least I said the lead of their argument, they saved for the final paragraph, which in which they said the Supreme Court's never going to follow the Constitution anyway. Okay, so the, I would begin to answer your question in the same way, which is, could 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 the Supreme Court do that? Yes. Uh, is it uh, it is is it a viable, plausible uh, uh, avenue to 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 go down in the interpretation of Section Three? No, it is not. That's why we have the Constitution. And if we can't depend on the the Supreme Court of the United States to interpret the Constitution uh, without regard to uh, uh, political or extraneous factors and consideration, then uh, we're uh, we're in bad shape in, in the United States of America. Uh, Thank you, Judge. Uh, Let me turn it over to the, uh, the the voice of the New York Times, perhaps in opposition to the Washington Post here, <laughs> David. <laughs> Just real quick on the Supreme Court, I do think, I think it's far from... <laughs> I mean, obviously, it is far from a slam dunk that the Supreme Court would disqualify Trump. And one thing I would raise as a as a constitution, a, a a a jurisprudential principle that has been used in other electoral disputes, and that's the Purcell principle. Now, I know it's not a one to one comparison, but the Supreme Court has said in other circumstances, if we're close enough to an election, we're going to keep 
we're going to be hands off. Even if otherwise we would weigh in here, the proximity to an election means that we're hands off. That would and be so a profound abdication of the responsibility of the Supreme Court to decide questions of fundamental constitutional imperative in a timely fashion. But I'm just raising that as this is something that the Supreme Court has done and uh, in high, very consequential circumstances prior to elections, it has said, come back to us later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's but, uh, what happened with say, Alabama. Let me say, David, that that in, you know, that's what the Supreme Court did in Moore versus Harper, mm -hmm. and in my view, I've stated publicly, that led to January six, and hopefully, they learned something by their abdication of responsibility back in twenty twenty or tw twenty. Yeah, 2020, December of 2020, when they uh, denied uh, cert on the, that case. Okay, uh, we're getting close to the end here. I'm going to ask a, a final question that came in from the uh, from the, the the question and answer, and at the same time, ask each of you if you have any any closing uh, thoughts. But the question was: At what stage do you think that uh, Section Three could apply? to disqualify uh, a candidate, uh, the former president, would it, would it apply at a primary stage or just at the a general election stage? When do you think that this issue can and should be uh, and is likely to be joined? So in, uh, please uh, uh, respond to that if you're so inclined and, and provide any closing thoughts as we conclude at the top of the hour. That's a great question, uh, Alan. I'm glad glad you or, or, or whoever a, a asked it. Uh, the, the first thing to know is that Section 3 uh, disqualifies an, an individual from holding future office, future high office. So I believe that that's all that Section 3 does. Thus is presented the question of of can he be disqualified from the ballot? Uh, and the the technical constitutional answer is is un, uh, it's unquestionably no. He he can't. But that's where you get to the you know to to the uh, jurisprudential uh, concept of 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 necessity for decision. Uh, and I believe the Supreme Court will take the issue because they will appreciate that to wait, potentially have the former president elected president of the United States of America, and then address whether he was disqualified from running or disqualified from that office to which he's now been elected would be a uh, that that would be a constitutional crisis uh, in, in America. Uh, what real quick on this point, um, without diving into 50 states laws on primaries, one of the things about a primary is it is electing the representative of a private organization. That would be the Republican Party that this private organization is putting forward as a president. In theory, the private organization could say, we're nominating a nine-year-old, <laughs> but then they just wouldn't have access to the general election ballot. So there is a difference between a, a primary, which is a, a joint public-private partnership um, on behalf of a private organization's uh, determination of who it's going to put forward for president. So that's just a different thing, and I don't want to weigh in on all 50 states' rules regarding primaries, but the primary is – fundamentally an enterprise by a private entity, but access to the ballot for qualification for president of the United States in the general election strikes me as absolutely squarely, you know, adjudicable by, you know, by the federal courts. Terrific. Thank, thank you both. Thanks for that amazing discussion, a super interesting, thought-provoking, uh, and uh, both uh, 
you know, I think the uh, re both reassuring and concerning and anxiety provoking as we as we find ourselves in inextricably uh, at this stage for for lots of reasons. So thank you uh, for that very much. We're honored uh, to to have you both participate. Uh, in this checks and balances event. So on behalf of the board of directors of checks and balances, of which uh, uh, Judge Ludig is, is one, uh, we're very honored to have him. We'd like to thank you for participating, David and Judge Ludig, uh, the audience both in the room here at uh, Pound Hall at Harvard Law School and online. And I'd like to just uh, renew my uh, invitation for you all to join our inaugural Rule of Law Summit in Washington, D.C. on the evening of November 8th. Please go to our checks and balances website, checks hyphen balances hyphen dot uh, org. I think I got that wrong. There are hyphens on either side of the and. Uh, and uh, with that, I thank the audience uh, in person, the, uh, the our participants, and all of you who have joined online for uh, for being with us today. And thank you very much, Judge Ludic, David French. Really honored and pleased to have you with us discussing this important issue. Bye. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks for having us.